morning, everybody. Okay, so as you guys should know, on Sunday mornings, we've been talking about this series of emotionally healthy spirituality. And I wanted to, real quickly before we get started, remind you that tonight we're actually going to start a new series that kind of continues this conversation. So tonight we're going to start a series called For the Journey. It's about spiritual formation, and it's going to be a time of fellowship, time of discipleship, and gathering together. And we're going to kind of learn about spiritual formation, but we're also going to practice it as well by having spending time together. We're going to um, do some worship together and some prayer together, and it's going to be really awesome. So it starts, starts tonight at 6 p.m., and it'll be on Sundays at 6. So I hope to see you guys there. That was that, and now we're going to go to this. <laughs> so we've been talking about emotionally healthy spirituality, and we've been working with this definition. So emotionally healthy spirituality is learning to love God with our whole being by spending time with him and then learning to love others in the way that God loves us. Another way to look at it when we talk about spirituality is that Christian spirituality is living according to the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit within us. And that encompasses everything about us. Because when the Spirit enters us, he doesn't just enter one part of who we are. He enters every part of who we are. And living according to the Holy Spirit within us means understanding that he is a part of every aspect of who we are. God created us in a very specific, unique way. He's created us to be equal parts, a spiritual person, a physical person, an intellectual person, a social person, and an emotional person. We can't separate ourselves from any of these components without losing the image of God within us, what's known as the Imago Dei. Our journey towards living in God's presence and power comes with twists and turns that can affect every part of who we are, not just physically, not just emotionally, but all of those. Ignoring any aspect of who you are always ends up costing you. It leads to destructive consequences. It destroys our relationship with God, our relationship with others, and our relationship with ourselves. And we can't learn about spirituality and continue on our journey towards salvation without acknowledging and understanding that every one of these aspects affects how we love God and how we love his people. It's important that we pay attention to all of these and not just some of them. Emotionally healthy spirituality is when we understand that our human emotions, which means the good and the bad, play an important role in living a Christ-like life. Our emotions play a much bigger role than we want to give them credit for. So we often focus on, you know, the good things. We want to improve ourselves, and we tend to push away the negative ones to make our seems feel or seem like we're fine. And we can't, you know, we, will, we put on a happy face. And we do that especially at church, more so than we do ever places. I, for one, I mean, I'm on the younger side of people in this room, but even I grew up thinking that church was a place that I had to ignore all of my bad emotions. Like once I walked through the church doors, all the drama was left outside. And I had to be, you know, the perfect, good, happy little girl that everything seemed to be fine. Because that wasn't, you know, what you did in church. Church wasn't a place where you dealt with problems. That's how I grew up, which sounds really ironic thinking about it. Because church is the place where problematic people should come. I know so many people of all ages who think that church means being fake happy and faking joy and making sure that on Sunday mornings they're ready to worship all the time. And that means ignoring all of the bad things and pretending that they're fine. But that's not real. That's not true. Real spirituality, really understanding it, means that we accept that in order to live Christ-like lives, in order to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, we're going to face not good moments in our lives. And they're going to affect us physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, intellectually. 
And if we want to continue to learn to love God and love people, we have to understand how it affects us. See, we live in a culture today, like I've mentioned, that believes in hiding problems and avoiding pain. Because let's be honest, no one really wants to feel pain, right? We do whatever it takes to not have to face painful situations. Nobody wants to experience pain and loss and grief, even though they're a part of life and we all accept that they're a part of life. That's why most of us grew up, you know, believing it was better to hide those problems. We tend to think that if we pretend that it doesn't exist, maybe it'll just go away and I never have to deal with it. We live in a culture beyond just church culture that demands that we avoid pain and demands that we avoid loss. And it makes us feel guilty for not always rejoicing and praising and being filled with God's wonder. We do whatever it takes to avoid because that pain, it's too much to handle. But avoiding pain doesn't solve any of our problems. In fact, avoiding pain only makes the pain grow more, causes us more pain, more problems. And we try to numb that pain. We deny that it exists. We blame other people. We rationalize it. Sometimes that pain leads to various addictions and avoidance of things. And so many people feel that any of those type of emotions like sadness, depression, anxiety, grief, that they aren't as important because maybe they're just due to our unbelief. Maybe they're something we deserved happened to us because we've sinned. And if we were a better Christian, maybe we would just get over it and move on. But that's not how life works because we're human and human beings are meant to feel emotions. We're creating an endless cycle when we avoid pain, and we need to try to stop that cycle. The greatest destruction to our spirituality is not living in reality, and the reality is that our emotions not only have the power to destroy us, but they do in fact have the the power to transform us, if we let them. See, Pain, grief, and loss, they're actually the places where transformation happened in our lives. The reality is that those not-so-good moments that cause us pain and grief, they're actually helping us because we're not indestructible. As human beings, we, li- we live in a sinful, fallen world, and we experience obstacles and limitations to what we can do. But when we face those limitations and we overcome them, we find ourselves being transformed into something better. We're able to grow into emotionally healthy, spiritual people. Limits are designed to ground us. They force us to rely on God and rely on him and his timing to make us into better people. We can't stop the rain from coming, but we can face it. We can surrender to it and allow it to change us, even when it hurts. Throughout our lives, each and every one of us experience pain and loss and grief for the things that have gone, the things that we can't get back, the things that we once had and wish we still had but are gone and we can never experience them again. We grieve for those things. But behind every limit, behind every painful experience is the realization that we have to overcome those in order to change. So the question remains, how do we surrender to the limits of humanity? How do we live according to God's power? How do we be transformed into emotionally healthy, spiritual disciples? Well, let's start by accepting that pain and grief and loss are in fact a part of life. And accept that the answer to this question might be the simplest thing in the world, even if it's also the hardest thing for us to do. Grief and loss can be found everywhere in the Bible. And they tell us how we're supposed to deal with them, how we're supposed to overcome grief so we can be transformed. Because there isn't a single person in the Bible who really had it easy, to be honest, and was still a disciple of God. 
But there was one person in the Bible who we're going to talk about today who had it a lot worse than everybody else. You probably know who he is. His name was Job. And there was an entire book in the Bible dedicated to his grief and his pain and his problems. And we're going to look at him because he's one of the best biblical references to answering this question. We can see his life and understand how we are to live in to our limits, live into our grief, and be transformed. We're going to talk about the story of Job, and it's actually a story for all of us. Everyone can relate to the story of Job, even if you don't experience the same things that he experienced, because we all experience loss, and we all deal with that pain in the same way, even if they don't amount to the same things. I know people who have lost their jobs, who have lost their loved ones, people who are dealing with the idea that they're actually getting older and can't do the same thing as younger people, people who have to move and are dealing with a new situation. All of these things can cause us grief and pain, but they all de- we all deal with it in some way. And like Job, we can learn to overcome that. So who is Job? Let's talk about that. Job was one of the richest people of his day. The Bible describes Job's wealth as more than anything we can probably ever even possibly dream of having. (laughs) He had everything. The Bible said he had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and a very, very large number of servants. For biblical times, that's a lot. He was very rich. The Bible, Job 1.3, says he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. He was probably infamous to everybody. They knew who he was. But more than that, he was also a godly, faithful person. He was a strong follower of God. And the Lord even described him as no one else in the world being like Job. There wasn't a single person like him. He was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. But then everything changed. One day Satan told God, you know, if you took everything away from him, he probably wouldn't be so different than everybody else. If he lost everything, he would curse you just like everybody else does. And God said, all right, let's try it out. And so Job went from a person who had everything to a person who had nothing. In all this, Job, however, did not sin against God. Can you imagine? He had everything ripped from him. His enemies invaded and stole every last animal he had, every last bit of his wealth. They killed every single one of his servants. His children, every single one of them, died of natural, a natural disaster hitting them. And he still didn't turn against from God. And God's like, see, I told you, he's like no one else in the world. And Satan said, yeah, but you didn't actually hurt him. Maybe if we affected him physically, he would try to protect his own life by cursing you. So his body was seized and infected with probably the grossest things you ever imagined. It was disgusting. He had to leave his home And move out so that he didn't affect anybody else. And no one had to see him and deal with him. And his wife even looked at him and said, what are you doing? Are you still maintaining some kind of dignity? He's like, you need to just curse God and let yourself die. Because this is ridiculous. And still, he wouldn't do it. He looked at his wife and said, shall we accept good from God and not troubles? And he refused to curse God. See, Job didn't deserve any of the things that was happening to him. He was still a faithful follower of God. He didn't sin, and this was his consequence. These were just things that were happening to him, life happening to him. And he didn't deserve to have any of this. But life tends to throw us curveballs, some mild, some super tough, but we can get over them, and some of them crush us, and they cause wounds that will never heal, no matter what we do. But Job models for us how we're supposed to handle grief, 
in the family of Jesus. Life goes on despite our pain, despite our loss. And what good is it to fixate on toils? Job didn't. He saw all the things happening to him, and he still managed to find a way to worship God. He models for us how we're supposed to grieve, even as followers, because he didn't die from all these things that happened to him. He survived. And if you get to the end of Job, he actually thrived by focusing on worshiping God. He reminds us that regardless of what life throws at us, whatever our experience is, whatever our lot in life is, we can face those emotions. We can face the trials that we face and come out still worshiping God. See, psychology tells us that there are five stages of grief. I don't know if you've ever heard this before. At some point when you, fa you face grief, you deal with denying it, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally you accept it. No matter what it is that you're going through, you'll face these five things. Some might be longer than others. You might be in one stage for years and one stage for five seconds. You might handle it differently than the person next to you. It doesn't matter. At some point, when we deal with grief, we'll deal with these five stages. And they affect us physically, emotionally, intellectually, behaviorally, socially, emotionally, whatever it is, they affect us. However, Job models for us a different way to look at these stages of grief. Because following Jesus is about transformation. And he demonstrates for us what biblical grieving is. How, as a follower of God, we can maintain our praise and our faith despite whatever it is that comes our way. So we're going to talk about those stages today. So the first stage of biblical grieving is paying attention. The word of God demonstrates for us that m many times that pain is meant to be felt. Without it, we lose sight of what's important. How can we put our faith and hope in God if we're constantly living a life that makes it feel like we're perfect all the time? Because that's not really putting your faith in God. See, the Bible gives us many different examples of dealing with emotions, dealing with grief. The entire book of Lamentations is a collection of laments, which are passionate expressions of grief and loss and sadness and depression. Two-thirds of the book of Psalms are also laments. Most of the prayers in there are ones of sadness and grief. In Matthew 26, even Jesus confessed that his soul was so overwhelmed with sorrow that he was to the point of death. The shortest verse in the Bible just says that Jesus wept. The Bible is filled with different examples, and these are only a few of what it means to experience real pain like Job did, but that is still worthy of our respect when we pay attention to it. See, grief isn't possible without paying attention to our anger and our sadness and our painful emotions. You can't work through grief. You can't work through your emotions unless you understand that they're really there. See, Job's life was miserable, and it was for a very long time. Like, this wasn't a very short experience. He dealt with all the grief, even though he continued to worship God. For 35 chapters in the book of Job, it's just Job struggling with God over what happened, trying to deal with it, trying to understand it, all the while saying, I'll worship you, but I don't get this. I don't understand why this is happening to me. He paid attention to what was going on. He paid attention to himself, and he paid attention to God so that he could deal with the struggle. Even his friends could see that the struggle affected him. When they came to join him in the book of Job, they sat down, and it says that they said nothing because they could see how big his struggle was. This was eating him alive, but he still praised God. The next stage is waiting in the confusion. This could be the longest stage sometimes, having to wait on God to deal with our pain. 
One of the greatest challenges in following Jesus is waiting on God when things are confusing, waiting for him to answer your prayer, waiting for him to explain what's happening, waiting on something to change. We live in a culture that needs answers right now. And so the idea of having to wait and listen to God seems impossible, which is why so many people actually just shove God aside. And when things get confusing, when they lose the control of their lives, they think, well, I just need to fix it right now. It's like, I'll move God out of the side so that I can fix it and make it work. And they try to do it by themselves, but it doesn't ever work. Because you have to wait on God to see what life is going to happen. You stay faithful to see what the outcome is. See, waiting is countercultural because the confusion working with God is not about quick solutions. It's about a lifetime of waiting on God, being faithful to him. And even when our closest relatives and our closest friends and the people who we thought were there for us leave, we have to be the ones that say, despite the pain, I can stay faithful to God. See, this stage, it's lonely. But the journey of God sometimes is a lonely one. But there is hope in waiting on God. We know that God never fails. We know that he is faithful. We've read the Bible. We know that he has met and fulfilled every single covenant he ever made with somebody. He will never leave us. So why would we leave him? There's strength in letting him take control and not trying to push him aside so that we can make it happen for us right now. Stage three is about embracing the gifts of limits. We're human beings. We have limits. We can only do so much. And sometimes the greatest loss that we experience, the greatest loss that we grieve is just accepting that. It's very humbling to hit rock bottom because it forces us to come to terms with the fact that we aren't God and we can't find our way out of the darkness without him. He is the light within the darkness. And without him, it's just dark. Growing up requires that we learn that at some point, our needs and wants won't always be met by somebody else. We have to rely on God to get through the day. A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. John the Baptist said this when all of his disciples were leaving him to go and follow Jesus. And his faithful followers were like, I don't understand. Why are you letting everyone leave you? He said, I only came to show people the way to Jesus. And if they leave me, that means they're going on to something better. And we can only handle what has been given to us. No more and no less. Job went from wealth to poverty, but continued to survive. Only by accepting his limits did God finally see fit to give him back what he had lost. Only by living in to that pain. Because it's in Christ that all things are possible. Not me, not you, not any other person just God. God gives us what we need, but he gives it to us in his time. We can't force it. We can't change it. And an indispensable part of spiritual maturity and being emotionally healthy is learning to embrace what we can do and stop dwelling on the things that we can't do. The fourth stage is to climb the ladder of humility. See, Job emerged from his sufferings transformed. He was still a broken man, but he was a changed man. He couldn't get rid of his past. He had to carry that with him forever. But he was able to climb out of it and still be a changed and transformed man. The ladder of humility, I know it's a little hard to read up here, (laughs) has eight steps to it. We're... Sometimes it's natural when we suffer and grieve to want to push everybody else down to our level, to get revenge on other people who've put us at rock bottom. 
or we want to shove people even lower because it makes us feel like we've accomplished something. But the ladder starts at the bottom, and the only way to climb out is to climb out. You can't make anyone else feel as bad as you because that's not going to heal you. The first step in climbing this ladder is to fear God and be mindful of him, to be mindful and aware of his presence with us. Step two is doing God's will and not the will of others. Surrendering to him is at the very heart of transformation. Step three is willing to subject ourselves to the direction of others. Sometimes God speaks to us through other people. He doesn't always give us what we, our answers directly. And we have to let go of our arrogance and our ego and be open to hearing from God through other people, through other circumstances. Step four is being patient to accept the difficulties of other people, giving other people a chance to figure out their own weaknesses because you are a human being, but so is the person sitting next to you. So is the person you go to work with, the people you go to school with, the people you see every single day. And we have to give them a chance to understand their humanity too, their weaknesses, giving them a chance to overcome it in their own time. And we can only res take responsibility for our own weaknesses. Step five is to be radically honest with other people about your weaknesses. It's one thing to admit your weaknesses to yourself. It's even one thing to admit them to God. But to admit to everyone else that you are a human being who has emotions, who is weak sometimes, who doesn't always have the right answer, takes a lot out of us. And if we want to be a person who lives in community, who lives with everybody else, we have to accept that and admit it to them that we are, have limits. Step six is to be deeply aware of being what's called the chief of all sinners. It's really easy to point out the sins in other people. It's a lot harder to point them out in yourself. So if you start at the foundation by understanding that you might possibly be the weakest and most sinful person in the room, then it's a lot easier to raise everyone else up around you, to see them as a person to show them kindness and be gentle with them and understand that they too are a person who is suffering, who is grieving and who is dealing with life. Because the honest truth is we're not the only ones who feel the way we feel. Everyone does. Whether they follow God or not, everybody deals with life. And part of this journey is understanding that we show them love because they're just like us. Step six is speaking less. I know that might be the hardest one for some people. <laughs> it's hard for me. But sometimes when we talk too much, we can't hear God speaking to us. All we can hear is the sound of our own voice. So part of this journey is accepting that to hear God, we might have to be the ones to stay quiet. And part of living into the life that seeks God and is filled with grace is understanding that wisdom comes from silence sometimes. The last step on this ladder is to tra be transformed into the love of God, where we are able to embrace our limits and the limits of other people, where we're fully aware of how fragile we are and are under no illusions to what we are capable of doing and how life actually works, that we are, in fact, emotional people where we're at home with ourselves, content to rely on the mercy of God and stop trying to fix everything ourselves, and where we understand that everything given to us is a gift. Life is a gift, not a right. And if we're to be a humble person who seeks after God, we have to understand that everything is something he has given to us, not the other way around. The last stage of biblical grieving is to let the old birth the new. Part of grieving is coming to terms with what has passed, what has gone, because there is finality to life. 
all things in life come to an end, and it's okay to deal with them, to grieve them. But it's also important to make sure that they bless us too. Our life, it should, it, our experiences give us power to change when we allow them to change us. We grow up hearing the phrase, learn from your mistakes, right? Because transform, transformation comes from letting the bad things in life make us into better people when we allow them to bless us. Job's old life was gone. He couldn't get that back. His servants had died. His wealth had disappeared. His kids had died. Those were never coming back. But with his unwavering faith in God, God used that to bless him. He built up his wealth again, and it doubled in size. He had more children who were more beautiful than anybody else in the world so that he could give them a better life. All these things came not because he asked for them, but because he said, God, whatever your will is, let it be done. I'll praise you regardless. The lesson of Job here is not just that life sucks, because sometimes it does. It, sometimes it really does. <laughs> and that's not what Job tells us, because you can read this and think, wow, his life was awful. But there's so much more to it because the story here is not just that having, following God is hard. It's that just because it's hard doesn't mean we lose God. When life gets hard, that's when God is with us more clearly. We can see him. We can reach for him. We can rely on him. The lesson of Job is that we will be blessed one day at some point in God's time. The journey we're on towards being emotionally healthy spiritual disciples, it's a difficult one. But when we embrace whatever comes and we continue to praise God, God truly will be with us and will bless us in ways we never saw coming. I don't know if you've ever seen this picture, but sometimes that's what life feels like, having to give up the things that we love, we've relied on, and we don't quite understand that what Jesus has in store for us is so much better. There's a rich fruit that blossoms in our lives as a result of embracing our losses. But the greatest thing is that we improve our relationship with God. And we will become blessed one day. I'd like you all to stand. I've got a closing prayer I want to say with us. So if you guys would close your eyes and join me in prayer today. Lord Jesus... When I think about my losses, it can feel that I have no skin to protect me. I feel raw, scraped to the bone. I don't know why you've allowed such pain, but looking at Job helps. But I also have to admit that I struggle to see sometimes how being new comes from the old. Lord, grant me the courage to feel, to pay attention, and to wait on you. You know that everything in me resists limits and humility and even resists the cross. But I want to have you with me. So I invite you to come into me and make your, me your home. To change me. To freely roam and fill every part of my life. And change me. And I want to pray the prayer of Job that even though my ears have heard you, that my eyes will see you now, that my life will reflect you in every way, every single day. And it is in your name that I pray this. Amen. Thank you.